Friends, greetings in his holy name. Scripture commands us that we are to keep the tradition handed down to us by the apostles, by word of mouth or by letter. Paul writes, 2 Thessalonians 2.15 Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or our epistles. How can we be sure what those traditions are? How can we know if we keep the apostles' traditions or some other traditions? How can we separate fact from fiction and decide for ourselves? First, we must examine any hard evidence we have. This would be scientific reports, published works, accurate translations of the scriptures, and especially multiple translations that compare one scripture translation to another. Next, we can use ancient published works. The reason published works are valuable to us is because the facts have usually been investigated by the readers. Some of those are experts. And if those facts stand up to that investigation and are not refuted, and the readers do not have an ulterior motive, then that article or book can be used as proof. Today we have a problem. We have a lot of religious tradition, but our tradition comes from various sources. Some of those sources are good, some not. First, we have the tradition we can see with our eyes. This is the tradition we find in those authorized and established translations. We can read those translations ourselves, and men cannot change them easily to fit their own agendas as they are fixed in the public domain. Next, we have tradition that is handed down to us from the true church, as opposed to tradition handed down by the church that walked away from the true church. John calls that group of people who left to start their own denominations Antichrist. Antichrist can mean a substitute body in place of the body of Christ, or a church in place of the church of Christ. Remember, Antichrist leaders also call themselves true leaders of the body of Christ. And they also say they are the true flock. But what else would they say? 1 John 2, 18 and 19. And this goes back to the time of Jesus, folks. 2 John 2, 18. 1 John, 1 John chapter 2, 18 and 19. Little children. It is the last time, and as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. The people who belong to the true church recognize Antichrist because the Holy Spirit reveals Antichrist to them. 1 John 2, 20-21 But you have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have not written you because you know not the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Those within the Antichrist Church, or the Wolf Pack Church, have no such unction. And it is much harder for those unfortunates to find their way home, but it can be done. It just takes a desire to seek and to find. The Antichrist Church has a man they call Christ, but is not Christ. And they pray to God, but not to God Almighty. Most in that Antichrist Church do not know it. They believe they are being faithful to God Almighty. Remember, they are deceived by their church. 1 John 2, 22-23 says, Who is a liar but he that denies that Jesus is the Christ? 
He is Antichrist that denies the Father and the Son. Whosoever denies the Son, the same has not the Father. But he that acknowledges the Son has the Father also. And one real clue that John gives is that the real church has not changed their doctrine from the Church of the Apostles. And that is the church tradition we can read with our own eyes. And that is basically the same today. That true church has not changed, and they still keep the practices of the apostles that Paul handed down to them while he followed Christ and Christ's religious practices. 1 John 2.24 let, let that therefore abide in you, which you have heard from the beginning. If that which you have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, you also so shall continue in the Son and the Father. And this is the promise that he has promised us, even eternal life. The true church must be wary because Antichrist is trying hard to seduce them into abandoning what they have heard from the beginning, trying to deny what they have heard, trying to say it has changed, although they offer no proof, no authority for this change. They make long arguments but offer little or no evidence. 1 John 2.26, These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. Next, another plague has come upon that little flock belonging to the Father who keep the traditions of Christ and the apostles, who Paul says we are to follow. 1 Corinthians 11, 1 through 2 Paul said, Be you followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I have delivered them to you. A serious plague called wolf pack and they too have traditions, wrong traditions, man-made traditions and they too use changed traditions to make disciples for themselves, teaching perverse doctrine to the church. Perverse doctrine means they refuse to submit to the true church's traditions. They refuse to keep the tradition of Paul and Christ and the apostles. In Acts chapter 20, verse 29 through 30, For I know that after my departing, says Paul, shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. The doctrine of the wolf church was perverse in that it was seriously changed from Paul's and Christ's doctrine, and the wolves would not conform to the apostles' doctrine. Follow me, said Paul, as I follow Christ, but the wolf church refused to follow Paul and Christ's traditions as written in the Holy Scripture, and went it alone, still claiming roots to the apostles, still trying to make disciples. Of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them, said Paul. So the fact a person can trace their leadership and tradition back to the early church means very little, because how do you know they are not the successors of the traditions of the Antichrist flock or the wolf pack. <laughs> what matters is, can you find your traditions in Scripture? Paul begins to tell us how we are to sort out this leadership tradition dilemma. Be followers of me, said Paul, as I follow Christ. Paul is testifying to us that there is no separation between his religious tradition and the religious practice of Christ. Follow me, he said, as I follow Christ. That is an important clue to us, and with that clue we begin reestablishing correct doctrine. Remember the wolf pack and Antichrist flocks were doing other traditions, traditions that made them visibly separate from the traditions of Paul and Christ. And Paul continues with our instructions. We are not to follow the world, nor the traditions of men. 
We are only to follow Christ and Paul who follows Christ. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Colossians 2.8 And we are not to follow those in the Antichrist church or the wolf pack who do not orderly follow the traditions of Paul and Christ. 2 Thessalonians 3.6 Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the traditions which he received from us. So they were the apostles' traditions, which the ones you find in Scripture. Finally, Jude implores us that we are to be are to contend for the faith as found not in church tradition, but faith as delivered to the saints of God. That faith will be found recorded in Scripture. Jude 1 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. With this in mind, we begin to examine today's church tradition from all sources to see if it follows the tradition of Paul, Christ, and the apostles, or if it is from Antichrist and Wolfpack. We need to know this, friends, because when we are finished with our investigation, we need to believe our findings. In our scriptural investigation, we will accept no man-made reasoning, no arguments using great swelling words, no unsupported facts or undocumented changes made to Paul, Christ, or Peter's tradition. We take Peter's warning very seriously. Peter warns us about a group of very educated men who use enticement and high-sounding words to lure a people who found the true church and who had escaped from error. 2 Peter 2.18-22 For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. These educated men, using their high, high words, promised, that the, promised the people liberty from that old law of Moses, that slavery, and promised them freedom. And yet those people failed to recognize that their new religion enslaved them much more than God's law. Now they had a new set of laws from a new source, rules they could not break, but which were not connected to God or His Son. They had formerly practiced the religion of the pagan world, and not these men with the great swelling words. Now these men with the great swelling words were dragging them back into that religion. Second Peter continues, while they promised them liberty, they themselves are servant of corruptions, for of whom a man is overcome of the same as he brought in bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. They were Christians, yet they were going back to the pagan ways. These converts to the house of the great swelling words had learned the way of God and his Christ and the apostles, but were made to give those that way up using the made-up arguments of those priests of Satan. Second Peter continues, for, if, for it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is returned to his own vomit and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. From this that we can see that Peter is stating that Antichrist and wolf, wolf pack are returning their members to the vomit of pagan religious ways. But unfortunately, from our vantage point in time, we have very little chance of separating the traditions handed down to us from the true church, the Antichrist church that was within the true church, and from the traditions of the Wolfpack Church 
that met under authority of Paul till Paul was dead. Understanding that all three of these church bodies will make the same claim. We are the true church. Follow us. Yet only one of them is. Two of them will lie to you by their false traditions to make disciples of you. And how will you know? There is only one way to know. Only one. Scripture. Scripture will tell us what Jesus and the apostles did in their church, how they kept the traditions of Jesus, and why they did it. We need only do a few things. First, we do not allow anyone to make false claims telling us that the tradition of the apostles have changed without demanding that they provide clear proof and authority for any change. For example, when did it change? Who with authority made those changes? And the scriptural proof that the church followed and agreed with those changes. 1 Corinthians 4, 16 through 17 says, Wherefore, I beseech you, be followers of me. For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. Starting with Jesus, what tradition did he keep? And that Paul followed. Be followers of me, said Paul, as I follow Christ. What was Paul's and Jesus' tradition? First we need to see Jesus' tradition and then see if Paul continued that tradition and then we can examine any evidence presented for a change in those traditions. Will the evidence for change stand up to sound scripture or will the traditions stand as practiced by the apostles? One thing I want to remind you, since you have been living in the world of late and now understand how those in power can use disinformation to deceive you, and since it is almost sure that the Wolf and Antichrist Church will use misinformation to make you want to avoid God's truth and His true tradition, I ask that you open your mind to give God's Word a fair hearing and allow that Word to prove what is the tradition of Jesus, Paul, and the Apostles in the early church, and what is the vomit of the doctrine of demons that the false church returned its members to. Now we'll go back to the first tradition. The first tradition is the first tradition and goes back to the beginning of time and creation. It did not come from the law of Moses, so it will not end if the law of Moses ends. And it is a testament, memorial, and tribute to the creator of everything and every one. It is the day that acknowledges God Almighty and His Son as Creator God. The tradition is the seventh day. God rested on this seventh day. Your God, my God, rested on this day. Genesis 1.31 to Genesis 2.2 and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. Next, your God and my God placed a blessing on this day and sanctified it, or set this day apart for a special holy purpose. God blessed and sanctified this day because on this day God rested from creating. Genesis 2-3, And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he rested from all his work which God created and made. How can that ever change? How can the fact that God rested on this day and blessed and sanctified this day because of his creation rest ever change? 
The day that Christ was resurrected does not affect the reason for keeping the seventh day holy. Christ being resurrected on Sunday does not affect the fact that God rested on and blessed the seventh day. One doesn't have anything to do with the other, nor can it change it. So that day and reason for honoring that day can never change. Thousands of years later in Egypt, God testifies that his blessed seventh day continues to be important to him in honoring him as creator. God gave the Hebrews a law with commandments, and in the very heart of that law, God reminded the Hebrews to continue to remember the day that honors him as creator. Exodus 28, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. God reminds the Hebrews that he worked to make the creation for them, and he did it in six creation days. So they too are to follow God in his example. They too are to work six days and rest on the seventh. Exodus 29, six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is a rest for them because God rested on the seventh day. Exodus 20, 10, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughters, nor manservants, nor maidservants, nor the cattle, nor the stranger that is within your gates. And once more, because it was so important that the seventh day rest acknowledge God as creator, once more God reminded them of this unchangeable fact. Exodus 20, 11, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and sea and all that is in them and rested this seventh day. Wherefore, because of this, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and he hallowed it. Then thousands of years later, another person named Jesus Christ, also kept the memorial day to the Creator and His creation and His creating work. He kept the seventh day, but by now man had begun to serve this day as a little God to be worshipped, rather than what it really was, a gift from God. God had sentenced Adam to work seven days a week to earn his daily bread in the sweat of his brow. Genesis 3.19, In the sweat of thy face shall thy eat bread thou till, until thou return to the ground, for out of it thou was taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. But since God took the seventh day and declared that memorial day to be a day of rest, God also made that day his undeserved gift to Adam and all of Adam's children. God allowed Adam to grow enough food and provisions working six days to feed himself and his family for seven. Jesus then recognizing that man had lost his way in keeping of the seventh day and was treating it as a chore and a duty rather than a blessing and a gift, taught the Pharisees the correct way to keep the seventh day holy. Mark 2, 23, 28, and it came to pass that he went through the cornfields on the Sabbath day, and his disciples began as they went to pluck ears from the corn. And the Pharisees said unto him, Behold, why do they on the Sabbath day do that which is not lawful? And he said unto them, Have you ever read what David said when he needed and he was hungry? He and them that were with him, how they went into the house of God in the days of Abathar the high priest, and did eat his showbread which is not lawful to eat, but for the priests. The priests are the only ones that can eat that, and, and gave also to them which were with him. And he said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. And then Jesus said something strange. He said that he was the person that is honored as creator by the seventh day Sabbath. Jesus was that Lord. Mark 2.28, Therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. And Scripture confirms that Jesus is the Lord Creator. Jesus confirms His position of all the things being created by Him and through Him, thus making Him Lord of the creation and Lord of the seventh day. The Sabbath day honors Jesus as creator. Colossians 1, 13 through 19. 
Who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins? Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all three things created that are in heaven, and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist, and he is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence, for it pleased the Father that in, in him should all fill, fullness dwell. Did you get that, friends? The seventh day rest from creating honors Jesus. Jesus was the one who created all things. And when he rested, he blessed the seventh day. He sanctified it for a holy purpose. The seventh day belongs to Jesus Christ. The seventh day Sabbath is made for and gives honor to and recognizes the fact that Jesus is the Creator God who rested on the seventh day. Mark 2.28 Therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath.